So one of the things that I've wrestled with t from time to time is I look at just the story of the resurrection, usually every Easter when we, when we focus in on the Easter story and the resurrection, is to hear the recounting Sadly, of... Sadly, it's only once a year. I know, yeah. right? You're right. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. But it's the recounting of that story, and in particular, the thing that I, I zoom in on are the, is the disciples didn't recognize Jesus post-resurrection, mm -hmm. at least not immediately. Right. And I was sitting here thinking about this talk and really focused in, in reflecting on the talk that you gave on Sunday, which was amazing. And I realized something. The ushering in of the new age, the ushering in of a change in the way things had always been, and if anything ushered that in, the resurrection did, right? The church was born in Acts, and everything changed from that point forward. The disciples had a hard time recognizing the body of Christ in the new place, right? They didn't see Jesus as he now is. And, and I'm wondering if that's a challenge that we're now going to face in the same realm to say, we coming through this, everything is different now, and I don't even recognize the body of Christ for what it is now becoming. And we know the rest of the story is then they go back to what, what we keep saying, right? We keep hearing this, going back to normal. The disciples went back to normal. They went back to fishing, right? And they're out there on the boat, and Jesus in his mercy comes to the shore, brings them in, reveals himself, they now see it, and and that's when the restoral of Peter happens, and that's when the commissioning that says, go feed my sheep. Now the church is, the new form of the church is born, and off they go. And Jesus ascends, right? Yeah. And so all that to say, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking about, wow, is that a metaphor for kind of what we're going through right now, is that things are changing, and we're having a hard time recognizing this new form of what church is. Yeah. Is that sort of, does that resonate with you? How does it, because yeah. that's what I hear when, from, you know, from your message on Sunday. Right? Yeah, well, I think what's happened, it, as what I was explaining on Sunday, is that it started out in the right place. It, it, the, the, I mean, it, the church was birthed in an amazing way. It was, it was birthed in the supernatural by the power of the Holy Spirit. It was the power that actually birthed the church. Mm -hmm. Even with Jesus, uh, I was saying, you know, here they were, they, the disciples were with Jesus for three years. They lived with them, they were with him all the time, they experienced him, they, they were sent out by him, they saw the powers, they saw signs and miracles and wonders. Like, and, and Jesus was teaching them how to do all this stuff, and then he dies. They, in that moment, they want to go back, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's the, the cool parallels in this. I mean, you see the Israelites, you know, they're set free from, captiv from captivity. And what's the first thing they want to do? They want to go back. They yeah. want to go back to slavery. And like, that's, that's, this was <laughs> not a good place. Did you forget? So yeah, it's the same thing. Like they lived a supernatural life, even with Jesus. And it's like, they wanted to go back. And then, you know, Jesus is with them for 40 days in and out, appearing, mm. disappearing, doing all his cool tricks, <laughs> you know, walking through walls. <laughs> um, but then I just, the crazy part is, and this is where I think the church has is, is kind of gotten off track again, is the one thing he said is, wait, Terry here, wait until the Holy Spirit has come upon you and there's power, mm. the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, and then go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, mm -hmm. Samaria, to the ends of the earth. The, the thing that we've done, here's, he's saying, look, it's, if you go now in everything I've taught you, you're going to miss something. You're not going to actually operate as my church. And this is what the church has done, is we've gone, we don't really need the Holy Spirit. We've got this, we've got the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's, it's <laughs> I've heard it said this way, it's Father, Son, and Holy Bible. Mm. Not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm. <laughs> we've taken out the Holy Spirit, and we've got, said Father, Son, and, and we've got the Bible. Now, we need the Bible. This is our, I, I feel like, I always say this thing, like, there isn't a greater author. Like, everybody goes, who's, you know, who's your favorite author? Like, well, dang, is there anyone better than, <laughs> than this is God breathed, the life that we, I mean, this is our true north that we can go back to. Mm. But then we have the Spirit in John 16, it says, that reveals all truth. So we have the Spirit of God living on the inside of us that when we listen and when we allow Him 
to have access into our lives and into our minds where we renew our minds. Romans 12, 2 talks about re renewing your mind. And, that's a, and it's the constant, that word is actually to, to keep renewing. It's, and it's through the word of God and it's with the spirit that we renew our mind. Then we, we begin to, to be led by the spirit to now operate in the power of the spirit. We've taken the power out of the gospel. And so it's become like just, it's, we, we know Jesus, we know God, but it's the one that's on the earth is the one we least know, right? When, the, when, wow. In your opinion, when did it take a turn? Oh gosh, it's over the years. I mean, and I'm not a... Is there a point in history you, you feel like... No, I mean, it goes back to Constantine. There's, there's, and I'm not a history buff. I, I like, I, you know, but I've, just as I've been reading some of these things, one of the funny things is, you know, you go, well, where did the Sunday morning, the 11 o'clock worship service come from? And, and I, I shared this on Sunday, mm -hmm. and I think people were blown away that, like, why do we have an 11 a.m. worship service, and why does it, uh, why does it go with, you know, your three songs, uh, the, the announcements, and your, uh, the, the offering, and then the word? And you're out, right? And there's this like routine. And you go to any church, it's like going to McDonald's. You go to any McDonald's and it's all the same, right? You go to any church and for the most part, you know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is if we know what we're going to get, if we, if we know like the McDonald's, it's going to taste like this, it's going to smell like this, it's going to sound like this, then where's the power and where's mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. so, so I think we've just, we've, we've shut down we've shut down the move of the spirit and and we've operated in a mindset where we know how to do this best and so this is where we've created the wineskin uh, that has slowly over time and so i don't i don't know that there's a point in time where i can say oh, i was right here uh, but it's just slowly we've shut it down but so so what i was going to is martin luther um, what he did is is he they used to have services like early in the morning on sunday morning and he goes no 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 we're going to change it to the 11 a.m. worship service because, man, he loved to go out to the tavern Saturday night and drink. And so he hated getting up early in the morning. And so he, he, he moved it to 11 a.m. so that he could go to the tavern, drink, and then get up, you know, get ready and be there at church on mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And so here we go. And we go, why do we do it this way? Or why do we do it that way? And a lot of it, all, almost all of it, is it's man-made over time. It's things that have happened. Why do we get dressed up on Sunday? Constantine like, was the one who set that up to where it was like uh, you had government leaders that were going to, to the church at that time. And so everyone was trying to impress uh, those around them. And so all of a sudden, it was like, well, you would dress up. You wouldn't just wear your normal clothes. You would wear a special, your special clothes to Sunday services. And we say, well, we do it out of reverence for the Lord. I don't know that we, because it's like in Joel, it talks about, it says, I don't, you rent your heart and not your garment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And a lot of it is, I think we put this, this almost facade on that like, here we are in our Sunday morning clothes, look at how good we are. And then as soon as we get back into our cars and drive home, we're yelling at our kids, we're yelling at our spouses, you know, you're right back in the middle of like, here's how holy we can look for a moment's time. But what kind of life are we living behind the scenes? What, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think the Lord's actually saying, no, I want you to live a lifestyle of holy before me. Not holy in the sense of, like, look how holy I am, holy art thou. And, you know, um, again, it's that, it's that that public view. But what are you doing in your quiet time? How much are you seeking the Lord? How much are you getting in the Word when you wake up in the morning? Are you really seeking the Lord and, and seeking His direction? Are you praying with your family? Are you, are, or is, are you, you know, every time your kids do something, are you yelling and screaming at them? And we all would mess up. I mean, I'm right here with everybody to go, man, I mess up all the time. But my, I can tell you, when those things happen, if there's a check in my heart and I go, okay, something's off in my heart. And I got to allow the Holy Spirit to have access into that, to actually reveal things in my heart. It's that Psalm 139, like to reveal those things in our heart that we can actually become, that, are, that we would be purified. And that it's in those times when we're, when we walk in the purity and not hiding things and not like, um, <laughs> 
not having those those hidden agendas or hidden things in our life when we can walk open handed and say this is my life before mm-hmm. the lord it's displayed that's that rendered heart um contrite before him humble before him uh, i think those are the ones that he's going to actually use for the kingdom and those are the ones that, that will be empowered by the spirit that's why you had the disciples you had this you know bunch of hoodlums they weren't the ones that were the prideful mm-hmm like Sadducees and the Pharisees go and look at us. You would think those were the guys, those were the ones that studied the word, knew the word, had the right dress, were all dressed up, not the fishermen. Like why did the fishermen get the Holy Spirit and these guys did, right? So I, I'm in this place of, I just, I want the authentic Holy Spirit. I wanna be real around people. I don't wanna have, I want you to be able to come into my house and be with me Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and there should be no difference. Uh, when my staff sees me when behind closed doors, when we're meeting, when I'm in public, when I'm with my family, it's the same me. And I'm humble, humbling myself all the time. I'm repenting when I need to repent. I'm before the Lord, and I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to engage in my life. Uh, so I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, no, but, it's <laughs> no, it's good. But I don't know. I don't. I don't think there's one point in time. Well, I think I, it's, we shut things down. Well, let, let's talk about let's talk about your transformation because you have an incredible story. You're PK, right? Grew up in the yeah. church. I really You've been around you. it. Your that, whole that'll life. mess you up on it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm sure everybody has their stories, right? And um, yeah. And then you go away. You decide to go into the business world, the secular business world. You become an engineer, and you're highly successful and. And your dad's running the church here in Castle Rock, and you get a phone call. Hey, you want to come home? And you come back, and you start to plug in. And w- when did the when did the stirring happen in you, and how did that come about? Well, I think it started. So yeah, with the phone call, I'm in Houston working, uh, doing development in Houston, and and uh, over a period of time when the Lord just shifted my heart, I knew I was supposed to come back, not to lead a church, just I was going to be the executive pastor. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he kind of tricked me into that one before I, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it wasn't until I got back that he, I realized now I'm supposed to lead the church. But then I see like, even now, like it's the leading of the church is because we're actually kind of, it's almost like crossing the Jordan again. It's like going into the, really the promised land of mm-hmm. what the Lord actually has for us. And it's not easy. And I think it, for me, I think maybe why one of the reasons the Lord chose me, I don't know, who knows why I'm like, why, why me? Um, but one, I, I don't have anything to lose. Like this wasn't mine that I built up and it's not mine to lose. It, and I just go, God, at the end of the day, this is your church. And, and if, I, if it goes from thousands of people to 20 people, like it's your church. And my job is just to be obedient to you. And if, and if I'm worried about finances, if I'm worried about all these things, like, then it's not his church. Then I'm, then I'm taking it back and I'm trying to control it. And so I have, and I have to do it over and over again because I go, part of me is like, oh man, sorry, dad. Like, you know, you built up this great thing and I'm just like, <laughs> it's just not what it used to be. And, and I, we've actually, we've shrunk in size and I, and I feel like the Lord's saying, it's almost like that Gideon thing. He goes, I can't do what I want to do when yeah. you have this and you only need this mm. and watch what I can do. And so, uh, not that we're trying to get people out the doors. Well, we are trying to get people out the doors. I've, <laughs> I've always said we got to get church out there right. and not in here. And, uh, but we've gone totally against every model that you would have to go, this is how you build up your church. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is it's not about taking people from one congregation and getting them over to your congregation. That's just, you know, you're not actually building the church. You're just uh, stealing sheep. You're stealing <laughs> sheep and you're, yeah, you're, you're just moving things around. How do we actually build the church? And this is where I'm like, first of all, we, we, there's a consecration of, we got to set ourselves apart from the world. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I, I mean, I hate to like blast the church because I love the church and God's church is the way that we're going to actually see the kingdom come. Um, but the church of today has not set themselves apart from the world. They've actually intertwined themselves into the world, uh, but not in a way that uh, to change the world, but the world's actually changing. Mm-hmm. So what, 
man, I couldn't help but think about this during your during your sermon on Sunday, and because you're right, you didn't you didn't pull punches, and I, I don't think you were demeaning to the church. I don't think you were being. I hope not. Because my heart is for the no, church, and, and I hear that. that. But I but on, on the flip side of it, you were you were strong in your message, and and I want to I want to quote something, and it's probably not exactly the way you said. It. I'd love for you to correct me if if I'm wrong, but basically you said. The way we've been doing church is detestable in the eyes of God. You said it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I got to ask you this question. So your pops is sitting there. Right? I know. And he's right? Gonna, and I'm he's... thinking about that. But I've done it too. Oh, okay. Fair enough. So, yeah. So I go, it's not just, I'm not, I don't want to, I'm never, I don't want to point fingers sure, at anyone. Sure, sure, sure. But how does it? I mean, I'm sure, I know you've talked to him about this probably extensively. Not that statement, but yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. how, how is he feeling? Yeah. I'm just curious. Because it's one thing to say, you know what, I've done it myself, like you just said, I've done it. But you're you're turning in a different direction. You're you're going in a direction you believe the Lord is leading the church to go in. Whereas, was your dad is retired? Is that safe to say, or is he kind of a? No, he would say retired. He's, okay, he's just um, refired. Okay, <laughs> so he's just doing he's doing other things. He's focusing in on counseling, doing doing a lot okay. of that stuff. But no. So so what? What's going on in his spirit as it relates to this? Because this is this is not just a hey, we decided yeah. we're going to move from eleven o'clock to eight o'clock services. I mean that, that would be that would be pretty radical in some churches. Right, right. You're talking about a whole another thing. Shift. Yeah, shifting the whole understanding of what church is. How's he doing? Uh, I think he's doing he's he's doing all right. You know he, what he's he tells me is uh, he's really proud of me and excited that I'm that I have the boldness to. To go after this, and he sees. I think he sees uh, the shift that needs to take place, mm. and um, and I think, and I love my dad. I, I, he, I mean, he the, he went after it. He has built up amazing things. He's the Lord has used him in amazing ways. Mm. Um, I think one of the maybe the downfalls, and probably of many um, pastors, and he really has a pastor's heart, is he loves the people so much that it's like. If he knows that if if like if you were to just make these radical shifts like this, like you're gonna lose people, you're gonna lose things. Like and it's that in my mind I go, okay, well, I'm not here to please man, I'm here to please God. And a pastor would say the same thing, but it's a lot harder for them to please God and and just make that hard cut of not pleasing man. Mm -hmm. There is there is that and so I've seen that in my dad. He bleeds pastor and it's because of his love for people. And, and I hope I have a love for people, too. I do. I have that love for people, but in a different way mm -hmm. that um, when he loves people, he, he wants to give them a hug. When I love people, I want to give them a kick in the butt. Uh, yeah. And it's a different type of love. And that's why, like, the pastor will do that. And I go, I'm not really a pastor. I don't see myself as a pastor. Like, I'm leading right now, and not because I want to call myself a leader. I feel like God's put me in a position right now for such a time as this to call out the church, to call up the church, to and shake up the church and say, guys, we're going about this all wrong. And the problem is, is everybody goes, well, they're doing it, and they're doing it, they're doing it, so it must be right. Mm -hmm. I'm like, just because it's being done a certain way, somebody actually has to stand up and go, guys, this is wrong. What we're doing is wrong. We've created idols that we're worshiping, and ultimately we're worshiping ourselves instead of God because it's all about how good we feel and what we've built up. And we say, well, no, we're doing it for the Lord. And I'm like, God never told us to do it for Him. Hmm. What He said is like, you abide in me, I in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Mm -hmm. And we're not actually abiding in Him. We're going out ahead of Him and mm -hmm. saying, God, here I go. I'm going to do this for you, and, and you need to back me up. And God's like, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. My children, in Romans 8, it says, are led by me, are led by my spirit. Those are my children. So I'm almost like we're like illegitimate children here. We're not, we're not walking in the ways of the Lord. We've created our own stuff. And, you know, I, some are doing it better than others, and, you know, they're going after the Lord in different areas. And, and I'm not saying it's like it's all detestable. But the problem is, is you can't, you can't worship God and idols and call it good. Mm, yeah. He's a jealous God, and there's you can only it went, He's like, you can only worship me. So what? other than that, it's bad. There's no yeah. good in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Mike, one of the things you made reference to in your Sunday sermon was around just kind of the way that the pastor has fallen in this old wineskin, right? The way the pastor functions within the body yeah. and rethinking that. And it feels like God is pulling you into a place of redefining what it even means to pastor a church. Almost, I, I think of it like sort of a hierarchy, a pyramid model, if you will. Ugh. And it seemed like you were describing almost turning that pyramid on Flipping its head. Flipping it upside down. So would you talk about that, about what you feel like? And maybe you don't have total yeah. clarity yet, but where God is pulling you in terms of the office of the pastor, if you will, in this new... Yeah, new, and let me, to your point yeah. about the clarity, I, I don't think he's... I, I feel like it's not like, here it is, now go do it. The whole point that God wants us to, what he's looking for is a people that will look to him constantly, mm -hmm. eyes on him, not eyes on a plan. So I, I don't feel like he'll ever drop the plan fully in front of me that I can go, oh, I got, I have it all. God, thanks for everything you did. I'll take it from here. He's like, no, I want your dependence upon me daily. Uh, but he does give us those downloads. He gives us, he gives us those plans to, and so I, I do believe it's like every day I feel like I'm waking up and the Lord's like revealing new things. I mean, just about like that part about outside of the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is not intertwined in the wineskin, we, we've lost it. And mm -hmm. that's, that creates the elasticity of what creates the new wineskin that it would never become old again. But I, I do see it's, it's shifting. We've created this hierarchy of, of leadership and we have the pastors that are the ones that um there to do all the ministry they're the ones i mean there's churches and and i'm sad to say there's churches that say that only only the pastor or the priest can be the one to pray over you or to lay hands on you i, I had i had people in our church i said hey stand up you're going to pray over each other lay hands on each other and i had people walk out because they're like oh no only the pastor can do or the priest can do that I'm like, no, that is, that's, that came from man. The Bible would say that we are all kings and priests. Mm -hmm. We're all meant to be ministers of the word. And actually the position of pastors, and, and, and I would call it the five, it's the fivefold ministry as it talks about in Ephesians. Mm -hmm. It's the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, and the evangelists, out of order there. Um, but, but those five uh, those are like the offices in a sense that it's not the overarching, and this is the whole thing, like you're saying, it's not here's how we suppress the church and lead the church. What we're meant to do is you flip that upside down is we're meant to be that undercurrent, that undergirding. We're meant to do what Jesus did when he was uh, at the Last Supper. And the first thing he does in John 13 is he takes off the outer garments, he puts them around his waist, and he kneels down and he washes the disciples' feet. Mm. And he goes, if you're going to lead, this is how you lead. And so I feel like my job is to wash the feet of people, is to raise, to raise them up, to clean them off and to raise them up that when that they can walk into purity and that they can actually, if I do nothing, if I'm known for nothing, I think that would be amazing. If, if I can have those that I can raise up under me and say, like, they're the ones, look at the ones who are doing the work of the kingdom. And my job I feel is right now is to undergird them, to lift them up, uh, to strengthen them, to teach them. Uh, and and I, so I'm in the word all the time. This is the book I, I tell people, like, this is about the only book I read. 99% this, 1% other books. Because every other book is, is just a reflection. Secondhand knowledge. It's like, it's, yeah. And, and some of it's distorted and some of it's not. But darn it, I better have this thing. I better have this thing like locked in because mm. this is my true north. And if I read anything else, how do I know whether it's truth or not unless, mm -hmm. unless I know this mm -hmm. thing inside now? Uh, and so my job in that, know the word operate in the spirit and undergird those and lift those up and and it's time to raise up the body the body has been this is the problem we've 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 crippled the body i talked about it um my wife actually said this we were in our prayer time we were in three days of prayer and fasting before this past sunday and uh and it was that it's like it the blood flow of the body has been has been stopped mm -hmm. and so it's we've and if we it, what happens if you stop the blood flow uh, too long is you start to lose limbs right mm -hmm. i mean and they die mm -hmm. and so how do we how do we release that pressure to allow the blood flow again and it's this is this is the body of christ becoming the body of christ which 
requires the Holy Spirit because it's the giftings that we need to, for the body of Christ to actually operate in their fullness. And the giftings come from the Holy Spirit. It's not talents. It's not the things that we think we're good at. Every gift comes from God. He's the giver of every good gift. And it says the grace of God is what actually gives us the giftings that we have. Hmm. And so you might have, and it's the other thing is I see there's all these like, well, take, take your test to see what gifts you have. That's a bunch of junk because the Holy Spirit at any time can give you the gift you need at that moment in time to do the thing that you need to do in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So you may think I'm a hand and, and the problem is, is you go, well, I'm a hand, I'm a hand, I'm a hand, I'm a hand. Yeah. Well, maybe not at this time, maybe you're a foot and, and the Lord's going to empower you in that. This is where you hear Paul say all the time, it's by his grace because it's the grace of God which empowers us to give us the giftings we need in the moments we need them. Amen. I, I think about um, a knife is used for cutting food or cutting, right? Yeah. But you could also take a knife and go screw, uh, uh, put a screw in the wall, couldn't you? <laughs> yeah. Right? Crown. So the, ruin the end of the knife. You could ruin <laughs> it. But the point is, and, and as I'm thinking about, and Hutch, I know you got a, a question as well, but I couldn't help but think back to one of the powerful things that you were talking about in the way of metaphor uh, on Sunday was the, the, the church being, um, we're so used to the pregame speech right and misunderstanding uh, that there's a game to be played yes. and not just okay coach see you again next week for the next pregame speech and, and as i'm as i'm thinking about your uh talking about the role of the pastor as being the undergirding agent right yeah, yeah. that from the body from the congregation we often look at that the pregame speech and the coach in this case the pastor is giving that that talk and then we break and we get out of there and we say, okay, coach, you're going to go play? Like, you're the starting quarterback, too. Oh, and you're also the receiver and also the safety, right? So go play. Yeah, we're going to be yeah. your biggest, you know, we're going to cheer you on. And when you come off to the sidelines, for, we're going to give you water and we're going to serve you and everything. But we've got it wrong, don't we? Yeah. We're, the, we're supposed to be out there on the field. We are. We are. We're supposed to be the ones out there. I've, I've, so I've talked about it now. I've talked about it two ways. One is kind of like, yeah, you get in the locker room and you get the rah, rah, rah. And everyone gets pumped up for the game. And then they all turn around and go home. And like, oh, you forgot to go on the field and play the game. <laughs> the other way I see it is like, it's like, okay, if I'm the, uh, you know, I'm the quarterback on the field and I get out there and we're in the huddle and we're going, okay, guys, huddle up. And this is where the bodies, the, you know, each part is the body. And so you have wide receivers, you've got tight ends, you have, you know, you've got your center, you've got every part that plays their part. And if, and if the center decides that he doesn't want to center the ball, it really is going to mess up the play, right? If he goes, well, I don't really need to play my part. <laughs> like, dude, you have to play your part because the game, <laughs> the play doesn't start. And if the receivers go, well, we, we don't really want to go out. <laughs> like, well, that's a problem because it was a pass play. And, and <laughs> now the quarterback gets sacked. But this is what I see a lot of times what happens. It's the same kind of thing. Everybody gets in the huddle and the, the say that, you know, the, the pastor or the whoever's you know calling the play and they're getting the play from the sideline the, the real coach which is jesus it's like okay <laughs> the holy spirit going okay he's calling in the play and i might be getting it and i'm calling the play on the field and then and then i call a great play and this is what the church would do the church goes wow they're all in the huddle and they're like that's an amazing play man if we ever did that, that would be awesome. <laughs> and they give themselves high fives. We might even like, score yeah, if we actually we, I execute I bet if we this. did that, we could score. And then they go, okay, all right, tell us the next play. <laughs> <laughs> He's talking our language, is he not? You gotta... Right? And you're like, whoa, wait, no. We have to execute the play, yeah. and then we'll get back in the huddle. We're so good at the huddle that we forget to execute the plays. We've made the main thing, the huddle, and never no, executed good. the play. That's, that's good. That's a great analogy. It's a sad analogy. It's is it's, and it's yeah, heartbreaking. So sad. It's and heartbreaking. this is what we do every Sunday. Yeah. And and it's like we're focusing, we're putting all our effort, all our money, we're putting billions of dollars in the church into making our Sundays amazing. And I'm like, what if we took half that money and actually used it to impact the kingdom mm, yeah. and mm. and outside the walls? What if we didn't have maybe quite as cool of worship? Or have our slides all set up perfectly, our huge screens that we need to have so that so that everything just flows perfectly. And what if we didn't spend half that time actually preparing? And it's not even, it's like not not that they're they're not even preparing in the word of God. Like I hear pastors, and I'm sorry, pastors, 
But I, I hear everyone going, well, you know, we're running through our messages and critiquing the message. I don't run through a message once now. And, and I can say I, yeah, there was times when I'd run through it, not with my team, i just run through it. But like, I'm like, I don't even run through a message. I get the message in my heart. I take a lot of notes. I and mean, these, these are my notes. Like, I took all these notes. I had, I think there's like, from this is Sunday's notes. Mm -hmm. And I took probably eight pages of notes. But come Sunday morning. How many times did you look at it? Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I had my computer up. I probably looked at it two times because there was, there's, if there's a scripture verse or something, it's, it's easier. I've written it in there and I'll just go to it and find the scripture verse. Um, and there was an analogy the Lord gave me and I just wanted to make sure I had it right. And I went back to my notes to hit that. Other than that, I, I, it was completely out of order of what I had on here. There was no, there was no order to it. And half of the stuff that I talked about wasn't in my notes. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, but the thing is, is I feel like we spend so much time preparing, getting this, this great message down. And I call it like the Ted talks with a, with a sprinkle of Jesus yeah. in it. Yeah. it it's like, yeah. we've got a great Ted talk, but where's the power in it? There's a, let me just, there's a scripture in second Corinthians. It's that, um, it's the, oh, it's first Corinthians. It's first Corinthians two. Um, where it just says, my, this is Paul, and he goes, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive mm -hmm, words, mm -hmm. but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith would not rest on my great message, on man's wisdom, but it would rest on God's power. How many of us in the church right now, me included, we want to have a great message that everyone goes, Wow, Pastor, you had a great message. Where's the power? Mm -hmm. What, what power is there? It was man's wisdom that we created. I'm telling you, I hear just mm -hmm. person after person, they're talking, but they're talking from their head, and they're like using the Word of God, they're using Scripture, but it's, but it's all up here, and it's not actually the heart of God. And I believe that when we actually tap into the heart of God, that He begins to move and there's power released. And the Holy Spirit begins to move in power. I do not want to operate in wise and persuasive words.